Hey folks, I'm the Amazing Vito, and today you guys are in for one heck of a treat. I'm here with Mr. Steven uh, Scholenberg, who I screwed up his name. I told him I was going to screw up his name, and I screwed up his name. But yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I said it a thousand times. I'm go. I practice your name. It's I'm all right. One times today, and then and then when I told him his name, he goes, "No, that's not how you pronounce my name." And I go. Oh my God. But th this man is, he's, he's worked on over 500 films, everything from uh, uh, my cousin, Vinny to um, my, one of my favorite, uh, my cousin, Vinny's great. Uh, I got the jacket and everything on today. And the, you know, everything from uh, God, I, 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 what a, a grumpy old men, uh, you, you name it, this man has done it. So Steven, thank you so much. How did I screw up your last name again? I don't know, but 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 it's it's not not to worry. But uh, I'm a grumpy old man now. But I'll let it go. <laughs> so, what was what was what was awesome was he told me when he started in the union. This is uh, we were talking earlier, and you know in the union people try you know get, you know when you get into you know into movies or you work in in the business you you have to be in the union you know 90 percent of the time on big films and 99 percent of the time on big films so when he got into the union he was number like 2000 there they, people are like something like what was the last person you said you met that you talked to they, they were like yeah there was twenty seven thousand. yeah there was a kid that was in the twenty seven thousands before i retired so and obviously not all not all those people stuck, but there I was just when when he told me that I I kind of thought wow there's a lot of people that came in after me although you know it was no longer a closed shop after a few years when I had been in they opened it up considerably uh, before that it took you years to get into the union you'd have to accumulate a certain amount of non union credits or get thirty consecutive days on a union show when no one else was on the roster ahead of you or 90 days cumulative during one yearly annual period. So like for my first, my first union job was with Ralph Bakshi on uh, the Lord of the Rings animated part one, where he had, he used more midgets or little people or whatever you would like to call them. I don't know what the politically correct term is any longer. But uh, yeah. more than more than any, had ever been employed, you know, in Hollywood since um, Wizard of Oz, and uh, they were and, and we filmed. He filmed the whole thing in black and white, as a movie, and then they took that and rotoscoped from that so that he could preserve the motion or whatever. But um, I didn't completely understand all the dynamics of animation at that time. I was really young. I was on the live action side doing the, you know, on the uh, editing, the black and white movie that he was doing. And it was just like, you know, these little guys up on, you know, tiny little bridges made of apple carts and stuff like that. And they'd be fighting with these little wooden swords and running. <laughs> it was like, everything was just, on, you know, sort of on a small stage, but it was all just, it was all just manufactured very roughly because they were going to paint all the backgrounds and everything in later. In animation. Are you, are you talking about the 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 nineteen seventy seven one or nineteen? Yeah, yeah. The uh, that one. Wow, that that one. one. You worked on that one. Yeah, I worked on I that. One. I love that one. Yeah, it was it was interesting. Well, we he wanted to do you know the whole thing in one in one go, but he had so much material. It was like our first cut was something like 
four and a half hours or something like that. And, and they had to pare it down to just part one because they didn't have the money to actually animate all that stuff, even though Saul Zance was the producer. He was just coming off Cuckoo's Nest and a lot of other successful things. So he, he had money, but it was just unwieldy, the amount of running time we had. And, uh, and as, as things went on, it, it pared down to just part one. So he, he never finished the other parts because the movie wasn't really su that successful theatrically. Well, do you remember what they said about Lord of the Rings? Before Lord of the Rings came out, before uh, Peter Jackson worked on it, they said it was a movie that nobody could make. Yeah. Yeah, well, he, he made he made part of one. <laughs> but I, I love that one. As, yeah. a, as, a, as, a, as a, a young, I was seven years old when I saw that. I thought people make fun of it or whatever. And I think, I, I remember Gollum in that, just falling in love with Gollum. How yeah, it was, it, it was interesting. We, we'd have these sort of off periods where he wasn't filming live and they were just doing the backgrounds and the character animation and stuff like that. So he would then move us on to, he, he had like two or three other movies he was doing at the time. I think Heavy Traffic was one of them and Coonskin maybe was the other. So we, we, we would be switching off between two or three films that he was working on simultaneously in different stages of completion. But uh, he was very volatile, Ralph. And uh, like the guy that I was assisting, you know, um, lasted like three days. And uh, I think I ended up working for, I ended up, well, what, my point was that I, I never got the 30 days with him because oh. I had to, I had to, you know, tell him that, that, you know, that I was working union, even though I was non-union and it was going to cost him money for me to go into the 30 days. Right. So he, he, he would fire me on like the 29th day and then hire me again, like <laughs> after a week went by. That's... So then, and then he fired me at the end before I got to the ninety. Right. Um, even though I, I went into his office one day and pleaded with him to like, you know, to let it happen. Cause there was like a heavy initiation fee that was right. involved on my side and his side to do it. And, uh, and, and he didn't, even though I had had this, everyone was kind of afraid of being with him because he would, he would come in in the morning. I don't think he slept all night. He'd be like wild eyed and crazy. And, and the whole trick was that we were in a, we were in a skyscraper on sunset Boulevard. About <laughs> maybe he had like the 13th, 14th and 15th floors or something like wow. that. And no one wanted to be in the elevator when he got in because, because he'd fire people on the way up. So we, everyone used to congregate with like I love a, this cup, guy. a cup of coffee in the Jolly Roger restaurant that was down on the bottom floor of the skyscraper right. the sunset. And you'd wait for the elevator to come down and like ring and the doors open, whoever was coming out. And then like five or 10 people would just run for it before the doors closed so they could all get in and the doors are closed. <laughs> So one time I, I, I did that, but it was just me because I was kind of late and the right. doors closed and this hand came in through the door and just like ripped the doors back open again. And it was him. <laughs> it, was just, it was just like him and me in the elevator. And I think he had just fired my boss like two days before that or something like that. Right. And I was like, you know, I was just like completely petrified. So I just like stared at my shoes while we were riding up. So I wouldn't, you know, say anything controversial. <laughs> I was just trying to shrink into the scenery. And uh, I don't know, maybe on like the sixth, seventh floor, something like that. He's, I hear him say, what do you want to be when you grow up, kid? And I like, I kind of look up at him and and I and I I couldn't I, I I just said the first thing that came to my mind was I want to be just like you, sir, just like you. And this big smile came across his face. Oh, and, uh, you know, the, the doors opened up, and then he went. I like how you think, <laughs> you know. And, and he walked off, and I survived another day, you know. Yeah. But it was it was an interesting show. Oh, but that is incredible. That that is terrifying. I mean, Larry David tells this fantastic story when he worked at Saturday Night Live where he would always get the boss would always get him at the worst time would always get Larry leaving and he would think Larry wasn't working. So, you know, he'd always catch him in the elevator and go, where, where are you going? And he goes, well, I, you know, I, I wrote three jokes. I wrote, I did this. I don't care. Get your ass upstairs and get to work. So Larry would, 
you know, go back upstairs. And so he was kind of, you know, he's petrified. There are guys, yes, in Hollywood, yes, that can put fear in you because- And Ralph, Ralph, Ralph did to a lot of people just because he was so promiscuous with his firing and he was a very talented man, but a little irrational. And, um, and just kind of in, in, impetuous, I guess you would say. He just, you know, if he saw you and you looked at him weird, that was it. You know, so. But Stephen, is it true that, I mean, um, I, you know, is it true where you're not allowed to make contact with some people? Is that, oh, yeah. I, yes. Yeah, there were, there were people that I knew that were for Spielberg and, uh, and um, you were not supposed to talk to him when he came into the editing room. In fact, um, you were supposed to, they would have multiple rooms and you were not to come out of your room unless you were summoned by the intercom. I mean, I never worked for him, but this is what people that did work for him told me. Right. And uh, I don't even know that he knew that it was, it was his, it was, it was his editor that, that I think that, enforce that i'm not sure that steven even cared but uh but that was the rule that you were not to address him or or talk about anything or if he asked you a question and said what do you think you were not to respond to that you were just to like hurry out of the room and say that you were busy or whatever so right. yeah that's not that that didn't happen in a lot of cases uh, i i'd say in very few actually but he was one in particular that um that it was the word was out that if you work there. In fact, I, I at one point they wanted me to go over there when they were doing like a film conform or something like that, and I said no because I didn't really want to work under those conditions. Although I liked the man's movies and I thought it was kind of fascinating, but you know it was obviously that you wouldn't learn a lot under those sort of, sort of conditions because they were trying to like deny all access. So yeah, well, it's, he he was a, a like. The stuff that he did, where like he he would go on, he would sneak on the set of Hitchcock, which Hitchcock was, yeah, you know, he was one of those guys you did not want to make angry, and uh, he would sneak on the set yeah. and watch how Hitchcock worked, you know. Well, well, you know, I saw Hitchcock when I was Hitchcock was a little more open back in those days in a way when I remember taking the Universal Studio tour when I was a kid. And and Hitchcock was like directing something. Well, well, the, I mean, that time it was just like it was just like a couple of trams a day. It wasn't any kind of big studio tour or anything. So, and you know, they, they, on the outside they'd have like a, the creature from the from the Black Lagoon or whatever come out and like glad hand you while you're waiting to buy a ticket. And uh, and then yeah, and then you just drove around the set literally and his dressing rooms i remember they, they took they take you through the hitchcock makeup trailer and then i i i i'm not sure i wasn't psycho because the psycho set was already there i'm not maybe i'm not sure what it was maybe it was pickups on the birds or something like that i, I didn't wasn't really following his movies at that time i was pretty young but i remember they pointed him out he was there like behind the camera and, and his you, crew was sort of there you actually saw him yeah, we were on a trail. We were on a tram, and the tram stopped, like you know, at a, a distance away. And they weren't shooting because there'd be like these red lights or whatever if if they were in the middle of a shoot. Right. And so they were just like they were just like either rehearsing or talking or whatever. And yeah, they just said, "Then that's Alfred Hitchcock. He's like over there doing his latest movie." And I was like, "Yeah, it was it was him." <laughs> you know? That's incredible. That is yeah. absolutely incredible. Yeah. You know, like I collect a lot of. You can't see them, but I I love I love Austin Powers and I collect all that. Well, I worked on Austin Powers. You I, yes, I know, and that was something that um, I found I couldn't believe that you know uh, one of the things that people were saying that Mike Myers uh, Mike you know um, Mike wouldn't allow uh, he was difficult and people weren't allowed to look at him. No, that see that that there there you go. That's he was the complete opposite of that. Okay, good. I mean, I, I I've seldom been around a person that actually was around more and, and than than Mike. He um, and in fact, you know, he was he was very uh, friendly and he just hung around as if you were like all in his living room or something, and uh, 
he only ate like you know hot dogs and Perrier or whatever. It was like every it was easy to get him lunch because it was always the same thing. You know, it was just like it was like a hot dog and Perrier. You know, yeah. Right. Um, but no, he was he was he was he was very he was very easy to work with. Also, that's great. Um, and they asked people like a lot of, you know, how, what do you think about it? I, whether he paid attention to it or not, I don't know, but he actually went out of his way to want to know what you were thinking, which was unusual. Well, and, well, um, sorry. The only, the only difficult time we had was, you know, we had our first preview on that movie um, down in a, a theater that was in El Segundo. And everyone was thinking that we were going to get an audience that was sort of a beach crowd, Manhattan beach kind of you know laid back crowd and it turned out that the you know that the research company had distributed tickets or the, you know had gotten foot traffic in this place called del amo mall which was a another town called torrance that actually was very heavily chicano so we had the complete wrong audience at the screening they didn't know what the swinging london of the 60s was or anything you know, so it bombed. I mean, we got like, you know, like a, out of the hundred, we got we got like a 29 or something like that, which was like, wow. you know, an F, you know, it was just like, it was do not recommend, terrible movie, whatever. And the studio like was like shocked that, you know, and, but he was coming off, I married an ax murderer. Yeah, that was great. So it was, I know, so, and that didn't do well. So it was, a, it was like this moment where, they were like, everyone was wondering if they were just going to like let him go or something like that. Wow. Um, but it, as it turned out, he like, you know, talked them into like doing another one. And he went off um, on a sort of a, a walkabout or something like that. I don't know. He disappeared for a couple of days and, and came back and he had, he had, categorized all his jokes along with the help of his dog apparently um into a b and c material and said that he and his dog had gotten rid of all of the c material jokes and we were now trimming the fat out of the movie and it was all going to be only a and b jokes right. so so we, we we worked feverishly for like about you know two weeks and uh and went to uh Beaverton, Oregon for a second screening and scored like 98, you know, or, yeah, or whatever. It was, it was the most dramatic about face, you know, I've ever been yeah. on. And uh, and everything was like fine after that. They realized it was actually a very funny movie and it would be, it would be a hit. But yeah, that first, I remember looking at the, the, the cards, you know, that you get back from people's comments and stuff in that first preview. And they were just stuff like, you know, need to see more people naked or whatever. It was just completely bizarre. No yeah. one got, no one got the humor at all. Yeah, I didn't, it was, it's one of my favorite movies. I mean, I collect, I've got all of his stuff. All I need is the pinball machine and I'm set. I, oh, you know, you know who saved that picture in many ways is Demi Moore actually talked the studio into giving it another chance. She was one of the producers. Oh, wow. So. Because that, that movie was absolutely, I mean, I, I, I love that movie. Yeah, yeah, no, it was, it, was, it was a funny, really, really great movie. And they obviously made a few after that. It became, it was a, you know, it's, it's a cult. Quite, yeah. quite, quite the franchise. Yeah, and, uh, but it, it, almost, it almost went down that night in, that night in uh, <laughs> El Segundo. <laughs> it sounds like an old gunfight. <laughs> it almost went down in old segundo well he he had an he had an aversion to the name el segundo after that if it ever came up in casual conversation or something <laughs> he would viscerally shrink you know back from it like, oh. like a horror movie oh yeah. <laughs> you know, oh. oh yeah so that was kind of interesting you know who uh so anyway back to ralph Bakshi. so the yeah the last uh, i was getting to my 90th day and we were gonna i was gonna have to we were both gonna have to pony money up and i went into his office and closed the door and said you know me i mean I, he's like i've been on and off this thing for a couple of months you know and uh i just was wondering if you'd like let me let me get into the union give me a break or whatever and he went you know sorry kid i just can't do that because if i do that for you i'm gonna have to do that for everybody and right. that's gonna like be really like you know financially irresponsible 
and blah blah blah. So I I I was off the movie after that. I never I never came back. Oh, but you know who did get me in the union was strangely enough was Hugh Hefner. What? Yeah. I was working on this. I was working on this Playboy. Uh, they had they had a movie and television division at that time. They were doing yeah. really really well. They had a lot of a lot of money rolling in. So it was a it was a movie called Whale for a Killing, with uh, Richard Strauss um, and uh, Richard Widmark, Dee Dee Allen. It was it was it was about uh, it was Farley Mowat uh, story about this whale that gets stranded in Newfoundland. Right. So, um, oh, is it the yeah. one where the whale can't get out? And yeah, the whale can't get out of the lagoon. It ends and the up, the people idiots want to, start shooting at it. Those people want to kill it and sell it to the Russian like fishing trawler that's yeah, yeah, yeah. Offshore. I so remember the, that. that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That movie traumatized me. Yeah, that was a, it. Was a heavy. It was a heavy picture because yeah. you know, well, we well, it was a, it was a, it was a, it was somewhat of a cursed production because you know they built this like the. Spielberg uh, shark and jaws they tried to build a mechanical whale oh. that would come up and like spout yeah or open its eyeballs and stuff yes. like that but it I kept, remember the eye yeah it well it kept sinking so 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 <laughs> it, you know so they had it on location they had several of them they couldn't get it to like do that it was took a really long time before and several models of you know aerodynamically approved whale faces before we ever got those shots and it was costing a lot of money to keep rebuilding it so Hef hefner wanted to like try to like get real whales right so he hired like two film crews to chase humpback whales around the world and film them and try to like steal shots right yes like, yeah so um so my job on that thing was basically every day I'd go over to, he was more interested in the whale footage than he wasn't actually any of the human footage, <laughs> strangely <laughs> enough. So, so I would, I would go to his house in Homeby Hills, the mansion, Playboy mansion every, every day around. You went to the mansion? Every day. I was, oh. I was, I took all the dailies. He had his, he had his own screening room inside. Yes, yes, house. he does. Yes. So I take the dailies of the whale footage that came in and maybe a couple of selected shots of the actors that the editors wanted me to show him and see what he thought. And I and I and I go into his like screening room where he had his you know projectionist and I'd get everything ready to go. And then I would just I was told to like, you know, be seen and not heard. Right. I wasn't to mix with any of the guests or other people, although he, he'd have like, you know, Jimmy Kahn would be over in the corner with some girl eating peanuts out of his hand or whatever. But I would just sit there and he had he had this incredible collection of uh, Cubist art. And um, What's that Cubist art? Surrealism and Cubism uh, art from like the early 1920s French period. Okay, okay. Um, Salvador Dali, for instance, oh, yeah, yeah, a lot, yeah, of, a lot okay. of him, you know, and but some other some other artists as well. But originals, I mean, millions of dollars worth of. I mean, it's like being in a museum, and no one in the house cared. That was the funniest thing. Like all the girls and most of his other guests, it could have just been it could have just been like a poster of you know the Beatles yeah. or something. I mean, yeah. I, they they had no idea. So it was like. You could just park yourself be underneath one of these one of the paintings, and they'd have like a little jar of M and M's or whatever, sort of in the in an Easy Boy like underneath it, and you could just sit up and stare at it to your heart's content. So I would just kind of move around the mansion looking at different paintings or whatever, right. you know, different one each day, and then he would come down whenever he came down in his pajamas with girls, without girls, whatever. He'd come down and. Sometimes he wanted to look at movies right away. Sometimes he wanted to eat first. Sometimes he wanted to say hi to guests that he had staying over. So I would just go up to him and say, I have, you know, X amount of film for you to look at today. And you let me know when you want to run. And then he would decide what his day was going to be about that time. And, and I would wait till I would wait around there until I go in there with him and we'd screen what he was supposed to see. And when he finished, I'd collect the film and then drive back to Hollywood and get back to work. So that was my routine there for man, maybe the better, well, the better part of the the 30 days came up, you know, yeah. and I and I had to tell him 
that you know that I was like non-union. So, so I was just kind of afraid to like let him know. But but he was he was very very you know um, easy to talk to and and everything. So after having sat there with him for you know 29 days of filming or whatever, I said you know I, I won't be seeing you after tomorrow. Someone else is going to come here and start doing this for you. And he goes, why is that? I I I, I like you having you around. I said, well, I'm, you know, I'm not in the union and, and this is my 29th of 30 days. And if I go another day, um, it's going to cost you money because we're both going to have to pay initiation fees. And he goes, well, what are we talking about? How much, how much is that? I went, I mean, it's, it's not insubstantial. It's thousands of dollars. <clears throat> and he goes, oh, that's not a problem. I, I'll take care of it. Just, just come here tomorrow. So, what? yeah. So you Hefner got you into the union? He paid everything. Wow, the man's a stud. <laughs> yeah, I know pe people had a lot of things to say, bad things to say about him towards the end and all that, but I always found him to be a gentleman. Yeah, everybody's always got something to say when somebody gets super old and they can't defend themselves anymore. Right. Um, he, um, that was absolute. that must have been a moment for you to just go, uh, because I mean, I was a, uh, you know, I was a playboy kid, you know, I, you know, and then when I saw Hustler, I thought, oh, oh. but uh, um, a different level. Yeah, it was a different. It, it went from from a, a five to about you know three hundred and fifty five. So it was very very different. But well, uh, I, re I remember Playboy is you know I'm saying I'm, I'm older, so I mean I I was I remember being in D.C. and there were like there was like a bookstore and they had them they had them wrapped in yes. brown paper wrapping the covers yeah. you couldn't even see that and my father was buying some other you know novel or something like that and I kind of went back to that section and like you know and cut it open <laughs> yeah. you know surreptitiously while they were while they were trying to help him out with whatever he was looking for I opened up the brown paper wrapping and took a look inside and went wow I, totally different time, eh? Just totally yeah, real, different real, time. real different real different time but you know a lot of people don't know that I mean Hefner had, like, I think that at that time, the second largest um, private zoo yes. in the United States. So the other thing I would do sometimes when he said he was going to go eat or something first, I'd go out to his to his big backyard area and talk to the to the zoologist that he had on call. They were all mostly primates and exotic birds. Was his was the his focus. Could you imagine having your own zoo? Yeah, it was crazy. <laughs> he had his own security force, his own zoo. Oh, yeah. He had, you know, a room with every pinball machine that was ever manufactured. I mean, there were different areas, and I, I had access to all of them. I mean, mm -hmm. not all of them. I'm not, I wasn't. I never went upstairs. Did but ever, but every, ever everything see, on the ground floor. Did you ever see a girl there that you fell in love and you just thought? Mm. Oh, there were there were there were a, there were a few, but I couldn't talk to them. Ah, some of some of them tried to talk to me, but and I, you, I you no, couldn't, I, I couldn't I, say I, anything, I, right? Well, I just said I, you know, I'm just here for Mr. Hafner, and and uh, I was told not to mix with guests, and you know, you're lovely, but thank you, you know. Wow. Um, but you, you know, no, I mean, you weren't you weren't supposed to do that. Yeah, yeah, but I, I would have totally got myself in a lot of trouble. I would have been like. Me, you know, Mr. Hefner said I'm supposed to be here, and yeah. you know, I'm. And well, I you know, I, I got a I slap guess, in the back of the head again. It would have been Hugh Hefner beating the crap out of me. I guess that's one of the reasons why I may have lasted was I I took literally you know people's instructions to the letter. You know, I mean, yes. when people tell you something and it's a serious instruction. I I I took it as such. But do you, you, know, do, so. do you notice that 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 I mean, it's. It, it, Everything that you've worked at, do you think that it's because people have said, you know, Stephen's really good. He does what he's told and he does it well. Yeah, oh, most definitely. I mean, people would call around and ask other people before they would hire you. I mean, because there were always multiple people up for these jobs. I believe I always got good recommendations because I, I did what I said I'd do and I listened to what they wanted to do. And in very few situations did I have any kind of conflict or anything like that. I mean, I'll tell you, you know, I mean, just as an example of that, 
work ethic, I think. When I was on Assassins, which isn't even on one of my credits or anything, I was I was only on it for the tail end of the show. It was this incredibly rushed schedule. They were trying to like make a movie and release it in like four months or something like that. So we were working around the clock. They had a hired at Warner Brothers a whole team of uh film conformists this was just at the time they were starting to go over to uh, electronic editing with the avids and whatnot and you get these big change lists of all the changes that were happening and then you were supposed to take the work print that they were still using at that time to like screen with and conform all the changes that were being spit out by the computer as to like five frames off here 10 frames off there new shot here new shot there whatever and, and like in a big rush kind of throw everything together like you know over like a 20 hour period or whatever and get it ready for a screening so they had people just sort of on standby waiting for you know reels to be approved by the director i'm pretty sure it was dick donner um at that time so and richard marks was the editor he you know he was he was one of the big names in town and I worked with him for a few times, um, but on that on that particular case, you know, the, so people were standing around and they were paying you to do nothing, like for a good part of the time, just waiting. And then when something had to be done, you know, you, you didn't go home, you know, until it was done. It was like you didn't shower, eat, whatever, you know, or they threw a burrito at you and that was it. So the producer came in, uh, one of the producers came in and um, he had like, like a dupe, under his arm, which was a black and white copy of the work picture that sometimes we used to give to people for uh, doing promos or the sound effects crews or whatever. We do a copy in black and white, cheap kind of rough copy of this thing for people to look at and start lining up music or whatever they needed to do. So he had one of these under his arm and he was just kind of like looking around in all the rooms. So everyone else was just kind of like talking or gossiping or, you know, hanging out, looking at the birds flying by or whatever on their dime. So I like went up to him and I said, can I help you? Or what are you looking for? What do you need? And he went, I'm, I was looking for your, you know, your flatbed editing machine. And I said, well, it's like in this room right over here. So I opened it up for him and said, well, what do you got there? And he goes, well, it's the, it's the dupe of, uh, the, of our last cut. And I said, well, what do you need to do with it? And he said, I, I was going to like look through it and take sections out that we wanted to give to like our advertising company for the trailer. I went, well, like I, I you know, I don't know the film as well as you do because I've only, you know, I only see the changes go by mostly. I mean, I haven't really like been in the screenings. I just do the changes. So I'm, I'm happy to run the machine for you and like, you know, make any suggestions or help you out taking the sections, marking them, whatever you want to do. So, you know, I sat with him and we, we worked on it for like three days and he got all the like things that he wanted. He was so happy with that, that then they, you know, they started getting near the end of the film and they started laying people off. So, I mean, from a crew of like, like 25 people that were there, then it was like 20, then it was 15, then it was five. And then there were like two and I was going, I wonder why he's, you know why I'm still working here because there wasn't really that much to do and at this point it was just like everything was sort of in the main editing room and we weren't making changes anymore we were just getting ready for the sound mix and and looking at you know release prints and things like that and I so I saw him again I said you know I'm, I'm kind of like out of work you know I mean I just want to let you know like everybody's gone and I'm all alone in that whole wing of the building there's like all, of, all the other rooms are empty and I'm, I'm there but no one comes in and tells me what to do or anything so he said I just want you to stick around we're gonna like look we're gonna go all the way through this movie together we're gonna look at the we're gonna check all the prints when they come out and do all that other stuff so I went sure that's fine so I got like another six seven eight weeks out of that picture Steven, you know what it is? It, it comes down to, like, and I've done this where I had to do, like, I had to produce my own show, I do my own little, my own thing. And if I don't like somebody, like, I remember uh, auditioning people and just within, like, they didn't know that I was the director or whatever, you know what I mean? Yeah. So just the attitude. Um, and I just thought, you know, I'm going to be working with this person for quite a while. I want to enjoy working with somebody. So I think 
how you how you 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 know you've survived by just being um, a good person. I was never in it only for a check. You know what I'm saying? I mean, to me, it was always like I had run away and joined the circus. 